I started to do uh, a little experiment with a new progeny protocol called SCIM uh, that became ratified as an IETF specification in uh, 2013. So uh, after my initial experiments with it, I started to take that as a, a full-time server implementation. And I wanted to do it in Golang. So uh, this talk is mainly about that. And uh, I'm not going into the details of the scheme protocol because uh, most of you I expect that at least to know or maybe familiar with itself at internals are mostly just a dumb JSON format. There's nothing really to it. Okay, uh, the fact that it's very simple and it's very expressive uh, in the way it represents the users and devices or other group information is what caught my attention. And uh, okay, there are some pictures because I like sun, sunset and sunrise, so I started to take some pictures in Netherlands. Uh, where I'm living right now, and uh, there are some pictures taken from my village as well, the farm fields. Basically, I grew up in a village in India, uh, so you'll see those pictures. So if you have any questions about them as well, I'm happy to answer. All right, so basically, it's just an identity server. It, it holds your users, groups, device information, and about anything that you want to store in your uh, typical LDAP server. The only thing is, like the schema is uh, not uh, a schema is different. It's it's not like anything like that you have seen in LDAP, okay? And uh, and then uh, all its operations are based on the HTTP protocol. Uh, basically, your get, post, delete, etc. You know everything the HTTP typical REST API. That's what it does. And besides that, it supports single sign-on using OpenID Connect and the SAML version 2. And after, after adding this, I thought like, you know, uh, like the PAM modules or uh, any other infrastructure level, uh, they only speak LDAP. But uh, this server has nothing to do with LDAP in the beginning. So I said like, okay, uh, I would like to make LDAP as a view for this. So that's when I said, uh, uh, the most important functions that are quite often used in LDAP or bind and such. So I, I added those two uh, on top of you know, Sparrow Server. Basically, it doesn't accept any write operations over LDAP, but just it does bind and search. Uh, in a short while, I'll demo that as well. And then, uh, then I wanted to do two FA. Uh, one thing is it's quite easy to do it on HTTP, you know, because basically it's a web application and you have everything under your control. And it's quite another thing to do it in LDAP. So, but because I have the complete control over the server that I'm implementing, I said, like, why not? Give it a try. You know, uh, so uh, now the 2FA is supported over LDAP as well. Okay, and uh, after this came a specification called web authentication. Basically, it is based on the FIDO standard, Fast Identity Online. I think probably you might have heard about it. It basically works with the tokens like this, where your secret key material is stored on the key, and uh, using your public keys that are stored on the server, you authenticate yourself. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna demonstrate that as well. And then, okay, this is all this is all okay, but without replication, there's nothing. Generally, you don't want to set up. Uh, your identity store without any sort of replication. As I like, uh, instead of doing a master slave, let's try to do peer to peer. There's nothing like master slave, it's just peer to peer. So, uh, and the peer to peer over HTTPS. So, I'm mostly talking about uh, authentication and uh, some of the new additions that I have added uh, in the last two years. Because Sparrow, I presented initially during LDAPCon 2017 in Brussels. Okay, and uh, over these two years, there were several, several, several new features that were added. Uh, there was, initially, there was no access control for this. So, uh, uh, there was somebody, I think, I don't think he is here in this conference, was actually asking me, like, you know, it's like, what plans do you have about access control in this? Then I said, like, I'm, I'm working on it, but it's not ready yet. So that's why I couldn't demonstrate back then. So, uh, I'm gonna briefly touch upon that as well. This is, a, this is basically how it looks. Uh, 
LDAP request, it can take the binary search. And over HTTP, purely JSON, of course, text. The binary that you see on the HTTP are the replication stream. Basically, uh, replication is done in the binary structures. Uh, so the, it, it's all binary and the only Sparrow can understand. It's nothing JSON or anything over the wire when it, when it receives or sends the replication events. And then the, there are a bunch of domain handlers because there is this realm concept that I wanted to work or, or model on top of. So uh, each root context, the equivalent of a root context is, is akin to a domain here. And uh, so there are a basic, uh, basic set of interceptors. And then uh, there is a key value store called BoldDB, which is actually an LMDB implementation in Golang. And uh, so that's what I use for data persistence. So the access control coming over here, uh, like, like Sean's talk in the morning, uh, Always RBAC is at the application level. That's, uh, that's mostly used and enforced, et cetera. But over here, I just wanted to just restrict the access to attributes and probably what information the user can see. Uh, if they want to store RBAC information to evaluate it at the application level, that's a whole different story. And that's when the whole RBAC and ABAC things come in. But uh, I wanted to restrict the kind of information that uh, the operators or the users of this particular identity server can see. So uh, it's, it's loosely based on this structure that I implemented. Uh, the permissions are stored in the groups. So uh, whoever is part of that group, these permissions will be evaluated against him okay, uh, at the time of operations. Like all, all read, or, read or write, and on all the or write operations, yeah, basically this Permission, these permissions get evaluated at the time of performing it. Uh, each entry is generally known as a resource in the scheme parlance. And there are filters, actually, you can, you can, you can add them. So, for example, you want to restrict uh, uh, this particular permission to be, or a set of resources to be uh, available or visible to only certain users who are of type contractors. Let's say in the second section of it, you'll see it. This is just a typical example. And that's how it is modeled. Okay, and probably I'll, t I'll give a complete example of how a group looks with these permissions inside at a later time. And then, of course, obviously the audit logging. And uh, unlike the regular log files, I thought it would be better if an audit event is modeled as a scheme event or a scheme resource, basically. So everything is stored as a scheme resource so that you can utilize all the search features that are currently available against the audit log as well. Okay, and uh, this, is, this is just a subset of information that is uh, available in the audit log on, of, in each entry of a performing operation. Okay, and uh, okay, that's my farm by the way, <laughs> back in India. Uh, it's a paddy field and those are palm trees. And the authentication, uh, like I explained, it'll be two-factor authentication using time-based one-time passwords, uh, both over HTTP and as well as LDAP. And then uh, web authentication using security keys. So here's the thing uh, about web authentication. It's a, it's a W3C recommendation. Okay, it's basically leverages the public key uh, asymmetric cryptography. So the secret key is always stored on your key fob, and the server only has access to your public key. And the interaction between the, the device, the authenticator, and the server is through the browser. So the old, old browsers generally support this. Safari, starting with the version 13, uh, supports this. Right now, uh, right now it doesn't, until at least 12. Okay, whereas Firefox, Chrome, and even IE support that. And the other good thing about this is that you don't have your password hashes stored anywhere on the server. Okay, each user carries his own secret material with him. And then the phishing resistant. Because the keys are scoped against the DNS, 
your password, uh, your keys are not visible for any domain other than the domain under which you register the key. Let's say, for example, we have Apache.org, I registered a key, and that someone tries to replace that P with some accented letter in a, in a different you know, language set, then the key will not be visible to him you know, for under the domain. Okay, I would like to present how that works. So here, I have set up two servers, uh, two instances of Sparrow uh, in Azure Cloud. And uh, initially, at the time of uh, first registration or, or first login, you generally log in with your username and password, and then register the key with you. Okay, by the way, this is just a dashboard that I implemented in Vue.js, just for the sake of demonstrating what Sparrow can do. Okay. So excuse me for all the sloppiness and the kind of like ugly UI that you see over here. It just meant as a, a demonstrating tool. Okay, and uh, so if you go to this my profile, for this particular account, I registered a key. Okay, uh, I'll walk you through uh, how to register a key later on. But what I'm gonna show now is how to use the key and sign in. Okay, probably, I think I'll show you at the same time uh, doing a single sign-on as well, that's better. Uh, Jenkins, probably you might be all aware of, Jenkins is a CI server which supports SAML-based single sign-on. So I just integrated, and uh, now I'm gonna log into Jenkins, not using the password, but using the FIDO key. Okay, uh, just for the demonstration purpose, I'm gonna put this laptop on top because I'm pressing, I'll be pressing. This requires a key press though it is not biometric, but at least it requires to uh, tell the relaying party that, okay, user is present. It's not an automated value or, you know, it's like another bot sending keys and, you know, doing the handshake. Okay, and uh, I need the username, but not the password. Okay, again, I, I put the both buttons here, and which is a terrible user experience, but just for the demonstration case sake. Okay, I'm gonna log in with the security key. And the browser challenges me to present the security key. Okay, and then I go and press the, press the button here with a little tap, and that takes me over there. And there I am. And now I'm gonna show you how to register a key. don't know what happened over there. Must be a bug in the view, I think. Okay, I'll go there. Because I restricted one key per device, so I cannot register a new key here. So I'm deleting it and adding a new key. And again, that requires me to tap so that the handshake can be completed. The user presence indicator can be set and the keys can be sent. I'm tapping it again. And there I register my key. And then I wanted to do this replication thing as easy as possible for the admins to set up. I didn't want to have uh, somebody sitting there and uh, adding the server IDs or the or IP addresses, et cetera, or which part of the tree I need to replicate, et cetera, because I've been through there. I felt like maybe something else, you know, it's like something better we can do. So uh, the way it gets set up is like, you send a request from this machine, which you want it to be joined to the other cluster, and uh, just log on to the other machine and approve that request. And instantly you're there in the cluster. And uh, the replication starts. Okay, and uh, I would like to demonstrate that as well. So we have uh, here two users on this machine, which is, and there's another one called ID2. Dot, here, I don't have any secret keys, so I'm just logging in with 
username and password. Okay, and uh, now I go to settings, go to the replication, and I'll say new pair. I'll give the host name. And the port number. And send the request. When I go here, I'll see in the settings. Okay, there it says there is a pending approval request. Okay, just before we go, you see that here we don't have many users. There is just one user here in the machine that is about to join the replication cluster. Whereas the other machine has two users and an application configured. Okay? Once, the replication, once I approve, approve this request, all the entries will be replicated over to the other server as well. And I'm just going there. Go to settings. And you see that that's the replication period over there. And you see the applications. There is an entry. And the users, there's a hollow entry. Right there. All right. And uh, of course, there are, there are several other things that, um, but there are, though the server supports it, it's difficult to work on the UI. And I haven't added many things that the server actually already supports uh, in the UI. <coughs> so here's the thing about it. Uh, how can I deploy Sparrow in production environment? Uh, basically because uh, it's inbuilt HTTP server that comes with the Golang runtime is not really mature or uh, can protect you against the DDoS or any other uh, several features that uh, your reverse proxies like uh, Nginx or HTTPD, the Apache, uh, uh, support and protect you from. Uh, but uh, there is an alternative that I have seen there uh, called Caddy. It's a pure Golang implementation of the HTTP you know, protocol and, uh, that allows you to plug in anything. Say, for example, I think Core DNS or something works as a plugin of the Caddy server. So you can actually embed Caddy into your own project and, uh, and take all its capabilities to augment whatever you are offering. So uh, this is how, by default, it works. The Sparrow it works as a plugin of the Caddy server. OK, uh, just to take you over there to Caddy. So that's Caddy. Uh, it's so people are using it as an alternative to Nginx and Apache HTTPD. And uh, it's quite well. And uh, it's so, at least my purpose, very well in this case, with all its capabilities to protect from uh, the incoming packet sizes, etc. Or It also has this uh, support for uh, Let's Encrypt, so that you can do HTTPS very easily with it. And besides that, you can obviously always run behind a reverse proxy. Uh, of those two machines that I showed you, the id.kidap.com is actually running in the second mode, behind a reverse proxy, behind <coughs> Nginx. The other one, id.kidap.com, is working as a, in the default mode. You know, it serves its uh, request. And then what next? What I mean, uh, what, what, there are several things that I have in my mind. But uh, some of them are a bit hard, and some of them are nice to have. One of them is this. I wanted to have uh, this n minus 1 connection problem of, uh, uh, during the configuration to be removed. Uh, one way I would like to see that is if you already trust a member, then uh, that member can also be trusted for by the rest of the peers in your cluster. So, uh, so based on that particular principle, uh, at the time of approval, I can also send him a view request or uh, the data f comprising the cluster's view so that it can automatically bind with the other peers and start replicating with everybody else in the group. That's one thing that I would like to add. And then, uh, yes, uh, when you say you have a server but uh, nobody knows it, my friend Sean said, like, why did you go for a certification? So, <laughs> so I said, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. But uh, meanwhile, 
you know, uh, the, I engaged with several other things, so uh, couldn't get it done for this conference at least. Uh, and then the web app that you have seen, uh, that needs a lot of love. And the other thing that I wanted to do definitely is a Kerberos, because it already does a lab, it, it, it works, it has its own backend, and it has its own backend management software of, uh, in the dashboard. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can even do the Kerberos key management as well. And uh, the other thing is like, I can control, I mean, uh, as an administrator, I can control anybody logging from any of these you know, streams, which are completely different protocols, but the session management, I can do it uh, just from single dashboard. Uh, the, the key, the uh, life cycle, everything I can control. And also, this takes the infrastructure problem I mean, into consideration. Like, for example, if I want to do a machine level single sign on, then the Kerberos is the only way. So, that's another thing that I would like to do so that uh, using Sparrow as a backend, I can do uh, SSO at machine level. And then, uh, what do we do with all this audit log that is getting aggregated? I'm definitely not replicating because that will be too much chatter you know, it's like between the nodes. So right now, the audit logs are just, you know, uh, they'll, be uh, they'll be retained on a per node basis. They will not be replicated across the nodes. But what I would like to do is uh, feed it to some kind of like time series database. And uh, probably you'll see some reports, etc. And I would like to leverage the functionality that is already existing in some of the time series databases like uh, I forgot the name of that. Influx. 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 So I would like to do with Influx. And uh, so that's the thing that I wanted to do. And uh, anybody wants to see the LDAP OTP uh, demo? If not, probably I will go to the questions section. But it's, it's not much, but uh, probably I'll, I'll, give it a, I'll give it a shot. So I have a user here. And I'm going there. And what I'm doing is, I'm just enabling Torpe for that, and save it. Go there. I'm logging in. So because I forced the user to register for the OTP, I need to scan the code, the regular business with the OTP thing. OK, yeah, and then I'm registering. So first time login, it asked me for that. It's 919, sorry, 31748. So it lets me in, OK? Uh, there's this beautiful client called Apache Directory Studio. I'm going to use it to demonstrate uh, the login to it. So it's uh, going there. By default, it doesn't on the port 9072. I'm going to check the network parameters. is invalid username and password because I only keyed in the password, but not the OTP. So I'm including the OTP as well. 543063. Okay, and um, connecting to it. Of course, within a minute I need to, oh, that particular warning is because the root DX Root DSC, I'm not serving anything for the root DSC. So Studio expects the root DSC to be there, so I'm just ignoring the warning. But otherwise, you can just browse the data over there. You can see the users, and then the groups and the applications. Well, looks like this user doesn't have any uh, permissions to access the applications as the users. 
So that concludes the demo of that. And to my good friend, who always stood by me and encouraged me to do that. Thank you very much. A big thank you. <laughs> There are no other questions. I'm just um, so you um, went over the non-functionals pretty well. You know that the server, that the server was able to do like replication and audit logging and maintaining internal security and stuff like that. But, um, and I know you went over this the last LFCon, but what about the functionals? I mean, why would I want Sparrow? I mean, um, is it? And I mean, I know it does Open ID Connect. Talking about Kerberos, do simple binds and stuff. But what's the what's the use case here? Um, uh, it's okay. It's basically what I what I what I wanted to do is like uh, there was this client who came to me and the ones uh, they were talking about uh, setting up open lab or you know it's like some lab infrastructure for them, and uh, the machines just couldn't accept it. I, I was trying with open lab and I was doing with uh, Apache DS. And uh, I finally had to go with the Samba. Okay, and uh, so every moment I touch that, you know, <laughs> I thought about you. And uh, even yesterday, uh, they were asking me, like, uh, okay, I can see the shares of a uh, connecting machine, a joint machine directly from Active Directory, but uh, why can't, how can I see that? You know, things like this. Like, then I felt like maybe <coughs> for the people who are not into the kind of like 100 million users or 50 million users, those are like very, very, uh, Rare cases, probably, if we uh, compare with the kind of uh, requirement that the clients have here. Like, uh, there are like probably a few thousand students, or maybe a few hundred students, right? Or a few employees, and all they want to do is like get some solution up and running, right? I thought like maybe why not? Like, uh, there is an easier to use provisioning format, and uh, this format can be easily uh, given to other applications that they have. Whereas with LDAP, they need some specialists. Like uh, they can't do a HTTP client and pull all the users, right? Because uh, they're done calculating, you know, cal calendar app or something. You know, my, all it cares about is uh, uh, a list of users that they are there, right? For that, they don't need to go and uh, take Apache LDAP API or Python LDAP API and you know start knowing how to do that, search filters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, instead I can just give slash users go. Okay, there you are. You know, things like that. It, it, it can be simplified. That's what, that's what my mo main motivation. It's not like LDAP is not as bad or something, but obviously uh, it was designed for, uh, it's like, uh, at the time, you know, to, to serve the requirements uh, during that time. But it's completely entrenched in the current infrastructure. And uh, of course, it's going to be there for a while, at least for a long while. <laughs> So you see, this is something that's available as a service in the cloud. Yes. Azure has a exactly. Service exactly. Cloud. Exactly. And that's another reason why I wanted to uh, uh, mimic the particular root context instead of some cryptic thing against uh, their simple DNS name modeling. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. Uh, one question about uh, the scheme uh, protocol uh, that you implemented. Uh, how do you protect? Uh, the scheme uh, web service. Do you uh, is there uh, an authentication on the scheme web service, and is this authentication linked to your identity server? Yes, uh, the same thing. It's just the underlying format is scanned. It's basically all your resources. Everything they are all protected by the access control that I have just showed. <coughs> okay, and uh, based on the authentication, yes, obviously. Okay, so authentication is from. Some no, no, it's, it's a direct, the server, like for example, if you connect to, if you do LDAP bind, what happens? <laughs> it's exactly the kind of thing that happens. Because the identity server itself doesn't accept SAML token. It accepts from a server, you know, a service provider, yes, it provides a SAML token, but it itself doesn't. It either works with username and password or username and security key. Yeah. Right, thank you.